Captain's Log, start date tomorrow. What will Dev Radio be talking about in the future? Well, one thing I can guarantee, it's going to be quantum computing. Now, you might think to yourself, quantum mechanics, that's a thing of science fiction. But I can tell you right now, it's also a division of Microsoft. There's a corporate vice president in charge of it. We've got him on the show. We're going to talk about everything it takes to put together a quantum computer, when it's coming, the language you're going to write for it, and everything else surrounding this, what sounds like science fiction, but man, it is real life. That's this episode of Dev Radio. Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Microsoft Dev Radio. I'm Jerry Nixon, and we're talking about Microsoft Quantum. We have the Corporate Vice President of Microsoft Quantum here on the show today. That's Todd Homdahl. Todd, thank you for being on this show today. Thank you, Jerry. It's great to be here. Uh, Todd, it's possible we have somebody in our audience who doesn't know who you are. Introduce who you are just for us. Yeah, I've, uh, I'm running the Quantum team now. Uh, I've been at Microsoft uh, 23 years or so. And I'm an electrical engineer by training, and you might know Xbox. I ran the Xbox hardware team for 14 years. That was a, enough. Three consoles was enough for one lifetime. Mm -hmm. I ran the HoloLens hardware and around the Kinect hardware. And uh, just this, a year and a half ago, I started running the Quantum team. Now, you've been on a lot of different projects inside Microsoft. Even X, Xbox, were you there during the, the Red Ring days? Jerry, please don't remind me of that. Oh my That's goodness! Really there. It it takes a it takes somebody with serious fortitude to be able to 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 yes. see That's us through that. A couple of years off my life. <laughs> I'll bet it did. Now um, now quantum is different, right? This isn't like yeah. another Xbox we're building. That's for sure. Um, is this uh, what do you feel? How do you see this? Is this a, a new angle for you, or have you sidestepped into your career, or is this a continuation? Well, I like to think that it's a continuation. You know, I've tried to do things that are, are big and bold and make a big impact in the world over the last 20 years or so. Uh, this arguably is probably the most complicated and biggest and boldest, but it, um, it's a, a trend that I've done throughout my career. Um, I'm incredibly excited about it. I think we have a huge opportunity uh, to make a profound good impact in the world with this technology. I'm my my brain is it's difficult to wrap around just the scope of Microsoft, um, right. and and I'm always seen I'm always surprised at the different things that we have our fingers into, and you know another reveal and I'm like we're doing that I can't even believe we're laying a, a we're laying a cable across the Pacific Ocean like right. what we're doing that too it's just these incredible things, um, and some of them really are amazing not just quantum computing do you think that uh, Microsoft Quantum will be is it a product do you see it it feeding back into our product stacks, or is it going to become its its own thing? What's what is it you're doing? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, we are building a, a quantum computer, and a, a quantum computer takes a, a lot of different turns. You need physics to to make a qubit. Uh, you need the ability to control that qubit with a classical computer. So we're we're building a special classical computer to do this. Um, we're also writing a lot of software. Quantum software is different. Uh, than the normal software that you see, and uh, we're actually coming out with a programming language in order to, to program a quantum computer. Uh, we're developing the applications that you would run on this quantum computer. We're developing the algorithms that you need in order to do things efficiently and effective. So it's a, a product. Um, it would likely be in a data center. Mm -hmm. you know, these quantum computers run at 20 millikelvin, so they're the coldest <laughs> things in the universe. Uh, you're not going to be putting one in your pocket anytime soon, uh, but the opportunity is to make our data center more powerful, and then there's this huge opportunity to make uh, products uh, like machine learning better, mm. uh, to make quantum chemistry, to make uh, uh, those types of products better. Uh, there's an opportunity to change material science with a quantum computer. Uh, we like to think that we're starting the quantum economy Mm -hmm. You're going to see this sure. big inflection point occur because of this. Now, your, um, 
in a lot of ways, you're leading a team up Mount Everest just to build the quantum computer, like to right. know what's over that summit, the next Mount Everest, and all the new things. First, let's build the quantum computer and just see what we can do. Who knows what sort of magic smart scientists will be able to come up with in the future, I suppose. Yeah, one of the things we always say is that what we're going to do with the first quantum computer is build the next quantum computer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we are at a, a very uh, young age in terms of the quantum era. Uh, things that we know make sense are, are quantum chemistry, material science, machine learning. But my guess is, you know, that when Faraday and others discovered electricity in the early 1800s, they had no idea that we were going to have an electric car a couple yeah. hundred years later. And so, or, or a quantum computer. Or a quantum computer, exactly. So I think uh, we're just scratching the surface on what's possible. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely, we're, we're at a turning point that's pretty, I feel a little bit like I'm in a Star Trek episode, to be honest. It, uh, it's cool to be able to say this stuff and not say theoretically all the time. It's pretty neat. The, now, uh, this, is, this is a hard problem to solve. Uh, you have people on your team, amazing people, like um, Michael Friedman is on your team, but he's just one of many really amazing people. He's a, he's a fields medalist. That's impressive. What, tell me just a little bit about the brain power that surrounds you. Yeah, it's, it's scary, you know, uh, trying to keep up intellectually with this group, but uh, Mike is one of the, the greatest guys there is. He did win a fields medal in topology, and he had an idea to take topology, which is a study of geom geometries under deformation, and okay. apply that into the physics world. And he's been working with a number of experiment experimentalists over the last 17 years or so in order to actually realize this qubit. Um, we have on our team, in addition to Mike, we have Charlie Marcus, who is one of the leading experimental physicists in the world in Copenhagen. Okay. Uh, we have Leo Cohenhaven, who is also one of the leading experimentalists in the world in Delft University in the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, Krista Savore, who is a, an amazing computer, quantum computer scientist, works on the team. Uh, Matthias Troyer, another quantum physicist, Gosh. quantum chemist, chemist from Switzerland. Uh, and then we have like David Riley, who's uh, who does all our control work in Sydney. We're all over the world. We're in Europe, Sydney, Santa Barbara, Redmond, uh, really trying to pull this whole thing together. And, and there's a lot of moving things here. Now, quantum, com Microsoft Quantum. Am I getting the name right? Microsoft Quantum. Yes, that's perfect. 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 Great. All right. Yes. All right. I got that part right. That's the yes. easy part of quantum yes. so far. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it's only been around for a, a little while, right? You guys really formulated Microsoft Quantum just in the ha last handful of years. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, we had a big announcement in uh, September at Ignite by Satya, mm -hmm. but uh, Mike Friedman has actually been working in the space since uh, 2000. He okay. started Station Q in 2006, and Station Q is our um, theory site that's in Santa Barbara. So we've actually been looking at this stuff for a long time. It's only in the last year and a half or so where we've been able to uh, develop the research to a point where now we think that we can build a commercial quantum computer. Uh, we've tripled the size of the team in the last year and a half. We've filled in all the disciplines that I've talked about, and we have an ambitious goal of coming up with a, a, a comprehensive, scalable quantum computer that people can use. And we were talking before the call how it feels a little bit like uh, uh, the Big Bang Theory sitcom, how it, all the different types of disciplines are represented, and you can sit around the couch and, I guess, play Dungeons & Dragons together. Yeah, there's no Dungeons & Dragons, but there are a lot of uh, theorists like Sheldon Cooper, Cooper, and there's a lot of experimental physicists like Leonard Hofstetter. Yeah. Now, um, before Microsoft Quantum, it was Microsoft Research, or is this a division of Microsoft Research? How does all this fit together? Yeah, the, um, this was a research program for, again, since 2006 or so. In 2015, we decided to stay in Harry Shum's organization, but really focus on, on building a product. Okay. Uh, so we are in the same organization as Microsoft Research, um, but we are def definitively going off and building a product. 
in your mind, are you building a software product, a hardware product, some other kind of product, or yes. all of that? <laughs> all of the above. Um, you know, we're working on a, a complete, scalable solution. You know, we have to build everything from the physical qubits to the classical control computer that sits down there near the qubits to, to make sure we control them all. We're working on all of the, the different applications that we could run on a quantum computer. We're writing the software that allows us to do interesting things with a quantum computer. So we are, uh, we're putting it all together and yeah. we're going off and talking to customers and uh, trying to help them solve some of their toughest problems with, with the, the product and service that we're developing. So today, you know, I'll write something in C-sharp. I, I stand on the shoulders of giants here where I write a simple language that I don't have to think about the compiler and the optimizer right. and the runtime and the operating right. system and the hardware and on and on. You have to think about it all the way down to, all the way down to the specific wires, like specialized wires that you need to handle these crazy temperatures that you're operating in and things that like, you, you just, you really are at the beginning of the beginning. Yeah, there's a, you know, there's a lot of work across the whole stack. You know, the, there's a lot of work to be done on, on building this first qubit, the topological qubit. Um, we are building, we build it out of a, a 3-5 semiconductor, which is indium and arsenide or indium and antimony. And then we put a superconductor on top of it and we run it at 20 millikelvin. Uh, again, the co coldest place in the universe. Controlling that uh, takes a lot of smart people, and yeah. fortunately we have the, the right people to do that. Uh, but then you need, uh, we're building a, another computer that sits at 4 Kelvin that works in conjunction with the qubits in order to uh, control and run the different algorithms that you need to run. And uh, above that, again, we're, we're writing lots of software. So this is a you know, whole team, it's, it's complicated, but at the, the same time, you know, it is some of the most forward-working stuff going on in the product space today. In the world, perhaps. In the world, yeah, I could safely say that, in the world. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's, I, I assume you spend most of your time just filling out patent submissions to, uh, for all the things that you must invent. Yeah, we have a, a lot of patent cubes that we uh, give out on the team, but uh, you know, my job is to 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 make sure that um, you know we have a, a great vision and that uh, all the scientists are, have the ability to work on what they need to work on. Uh, we also spend a lot of time on developing the the framework by which we execute the program, and then um, you know we're trying to create a new culture here too. We want to take the best of industry as well as the, the best of academia. There still are things that we're researching, so where it's appropriate to apply engineers to, we're applying a bunch of engineers and, mm -hmm. and uh, making things more product-like, but there still are things that we need to research, and that's where it's great to still be situated on these different campuses and be able to, to tap into that culture. Now, um, thinking about Microsoft uh, Quantum, uh, you know, I know that it's special in a lot of ways. And one, one of the things you kind of uh, spoke about was the qubit. And, of course, this qubit is like a, it's like a regular transistor, right, where it's either one or zero, except for the quantum bit is one, zero, and then this magical superposition of one and zero at, right. I, I guess, the same time. It yeah. seems so crazy to say it. But um, I know that there's different ways of, of building these qubits. Microsoft has a very unique way of doing it. Every, it seems like everybody in this space has picked their own uh, direction. What makes Microsoft special here? Yeah, the, you know, the, the beauty of a qubit, again, is like you said, Jerry, it is a zero. It can be a zero and a one at the same time. And that gives you the opportunity to explore exponential computational spaces. And what we're doing is uh, we're working on what's called a, a topological qubit, and it came, came out of Mike's work in, in topology. Mm -hmm. And what he was looking at and what we've since you know, continued to spend uh, a lot of resources on is developing a qubit that's much more immune to noise. Okay. And uh, when you look at qubits, you want them to maintain their quantumness for a long period of time. And we believe that we have the qubit that, uh, and the, what they call is the decoherence time. You want it to last a long time before it decoheres. 
we believe that we will have uh, the longest uh, decoherence times. We think that we're going to be on the order of three or four orders of magnitude better than anybody else. So it's a thousand to ten thousand wow. times better. And where that comes into play is that in a quantum computer, uh, you need a lot of error correction. And if ours, let's say, is three or four orders of magnitude better than the competition. Oh, yeah. One of, our, one of our qubits is going to be worth 1,000 to 10,000 of their qubits. And when you think about you know, trying to do something interesting, needing 100 qubits, uh, where, they, where we would have 100 qubits, um, they might have 100,000 or even a million qubits. And trying to control those qubits and do something interesting is very hard. So we're, we're really trying to build the best building block that we possibly mm -hmm. can and do all of our error correction with quantum as opposed to trying to do it uh, in software. So that, that's, a, that's a, a big deal. We're playing yeah. the long game. Uh, we believe that ultimately that will get us to a solution that solves real problems sooner. And in conjunction with all of that, we're writing, again, the software, the ability to control it all at the same time. The, uh, I want to ask you a little bit about the long game and the timing of things here in a minute. But first, I want to just talk about this, um, this idea of orders of magnitude for the qubit. There's, there's this idea of uh, physical and logical qubits. And my mind doesn't really separate what the, the difference is. Can you help me understand it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, a physical qubit is the actual qubit that you build up, uh, in our case, with a, a semiconductor and a, and a superconductor. The logical qubits are the number, the types of qubits that you need to do a quantum gate. Uh. And in our case, you know, we're hoping that you'll need 10 physical qubits to do one logic, as an example. Yeah. Where these other designs might need 10,000 or 100,000 physical qubits to do one logical qubit. And then again, you can go back and just see how hard it is to control um, all of those physical qubits. Like we may need 1,000 physical qubits to do 100 logical qubits. And you can do interesting things with 100 logical qubits. Other designs, again, will need 1,000, 10,000 times yeah. that. And I just. Could it just makes it really hard to do. So the, the goal is to get the logical qubits because that's where the actual computation is going to be executed. Right, right. Um, talk to me now inside this, say, community of competitors a little bit that everybody's trying to build a quantum computer. Microsoft isn't alone. There are other, right, right. other organizations. Um, what's, the, what's the community like? Uh, do you, are you sharing technology between each other? Like, let's see how fast we can get to quantum computing. Or is it pretty is it pretty competitive and pretty closed? I think it's like a lot of things. There's cooperation on some levels and competition. You know, we're all in, well, most of us are in for-profit companies, so there's sure. comp competition there. But this is um, pure science in a lot of ways, too. So there is, you know, yeah. there, there are a lot of different conferences where people share some of the, the peer science. And the things that we're doing, you know, they ultimately have to be peer-reviewed. Right, and so there's you know published a lot of publishing that goes on with what what we're doing, and, and people get information that way. Uh, but you know there are certain things that uh, you want to clo hold closer to the vest than others, mm -hmm. and, and and we do that. But you know for the most part, um, you know we want quantum to be successful. We want to sure. be first there, but uh, you know there's a, there's a little bit of. Uh, um, poking the, the competition, but there's also so, a, a lot of opportunities to cooperate as well. In, in this um, race, is th how many winners can there be? Is it, is it just one, whoever gets there first? I think it was a lot of things, you know, first will make a, a, have a big impact, but there's often room for, you know, a couple to play. And then if you can differentiate yourself, which we're trying to do, that's always an opportunity to to get customers and to show your value. Uh, I don't, I, it's always hard to say how many people are, are going to be playing in this space, but you know, first is always good. Doing something unique is always good. You can imagine that there are going to be two or three players and, mm -hmm. and that's going to be about it. Wait, there's a, 
Well, does Microsoft have a chance? Of course. Of course we do. Course. Absolutely we do. Like I oh. said, we're, uh, we believe wholeheartedly in, in the, the plan that we have and the approach that we're taking, the approach around topological qubits, the approach around building a, a scalable end-to-end -end, uh, technology, the, the team that we have that's all over the world that's coming together to build this. Uh, we we are, are very confident in what we're doing. All right, so when marketing meets science, sometimes some things become kind of unclear, at least from on the outside looking in. Uh, so <laughs> when we say we're building the whole stack, and of course I feel of myself as a full stack developer, but I know right. that's not the same thing. What's the whole stack in the quantum sense? The whole stack in the quantum set is starting from you know that, that work that's going on at uh, 20 millikelvin, the qubit, to controlling it. You have to actually control it at 20 millikelvin too. So we're building the, the physics there. Uh, we're building a technology at 4K that's 100x uh, more performant than CMOS for the same power level. Uh, in order to be able to work uh, with uh, these these qubits, and that's that's a lot of our effort, because you can imagine that you know, these things sit in a in a helium refrigerator, and if it gets too hot, you're going to uh, wreck the 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 the, the, quant the qubit. It's going to collapse its wave function, and you're not going to keep it in superposition. So we're working on, on all that. We're also developing the software that you run on this classical computer. Um, we're working on building the programming languages that you need to program it. Yeah. We're working on the algorithms, the applications. And that gives us, there, there's a couple things here that I think are really uh, important. One is that we're architecting it as a full scale, full stack solution. And, and so we're thinking about, you know, at the beginning, what's it going to take to run thousands of qubits to make sure yeah. that our programming language can handle that to make sure our control systems can handle it. And the second thing is that we can make trade-offs within that stack if we have to uh, in order to um, address certain issues. So it, if you're architecting something, you, know, you always want to have as many knobs that you can turn. And I would argue yeah. that we have the most knobs to turn uh, in developing our quantum computer. Well, the, not, turning knobs is the Microsoft way. That was always yeah. been a, a way to uh, a way to win, and to the developers' hearts too, in a lot of ways too. The um, talk to me a, a little bit about just size. Uh, today, um, I think the largest Azure data center is a mile long, and I, you know, I always kind of pity the guy who has to mop the floor right. because that's a long way to mop. And when I look at a quantum data center of the future, of course, you know, this is going to be a little while. Um, is it a mile long, or does this fit in you know, the backseat of a Volkswagen? It's going to be somewhere in between there. You know, it's not going to be a mile long. It probably won't fit in the backseat of a Volkswagen, but it will work nicely in, a, in an Azure data center. I mean, it, you're, you're going, again, it's not something you're going to put in your pocket or your Volkswagen. Right. Uh, but there is an opportunity for it to run in your Azure data center and do a lot of interesting things. The um, I I heard, and this is I think what you were uh, kind of saying. And in fact, I think some of the scientists that you mentioned by name, I saw in the keynote with Sacha when he was talking about quantum and kind of revealing all of this work that we right. were doing. And um, man, the, the way he was talking about it, you're already sitting on a quantum computer. Uh, it's but now we're talking about it. Sounds like it may be a little further out. What's what's taking so long here? Is it? Uh, are we looking at? Tomorrow, are you announcing this for Christmas sort of thing, or is this going to, or are my grandchildren going to be using it? It's not your grandchildren. It's not. It's not uh, this Christmas either. <laughs> uh, it is. It is complicated. Uh, that said, you know, we're targeting within the next five years uh, that we have a quantum computer that people can play with. Uh, you can get simulators now, or and you can start playing with the programming language now, and then we believe within in five years you'll be able to. Uh, do very interesting things with your quantum computer. Wow. Wow. That's a tinier number than I expected you to say. I'll just be honest. Uh, Microsoft used to be a, a PC on every desk. I guess it's going to be a quantum computer accessible PC on every desk. That'll be the... Well, will, is this, are, we, are you creating something that will benefit 
Um, every person, do you think, like, will I be using this in my daily routine, or is this going to be something specific to only banks and the Department of Defense and, and you know, large enterprises? Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're going to be, like, surfing the web with your quantum computer, for example, or doing your email. But, uh, you know, the quantum computer where it does work, work really well, or it could potentially unlock the, the drug that saves somebody you love's life. It could potentially um, create an ML algorithm that makes a self-driving car a, a better car. It could be mm. the uh, material that allows us to build a lighter weight product. It could be uh, the material that allows us to develop superconductivity at room temperature. Mm -hmm. and so we're not spending you know, 5% of our energy just transmitting electrons around. So there's, uh, and it, we're so new, it's, it's always hard to tell, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I believe I can say right off the top of my head it's going to impact your life. Uh, and then I can say that there, there are some things that we don't even know about where it's going to come in to uh, do amazing things for you. Um, the audience of, of Dev Radio, there's a lot of developers. Um, what would you anticipate would be the impact to software development? What would be the short-term impact to software developers that are listening right now? And they're like, how is this going to impact my career, my, my job, my job, my, maybe my technical choices that I make in the future? Uh, learn li learn li linear algebra quickly. No. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, you say that jokingly, but I mean that's it partly is a, true. A lot of linear algebra, yeah, and it's fortunately it's it's similar to some of the stuff you do in machine learning, so some of that translates over. But you know we are coming out with a, we have come out with a new programming language mm -hmm. that's called Q Sharp, and uh, it, it is fits right into Visual Studio. So if you're a, a Microsoft developer. You should find it easy to use the tools. And we've developed a simulator that runs on your laptop. And uh, companies in the future will have access to an Azure simulator as well. But oh, cool. Uh, cool. yeah, my, you know, I would you know, start playing with this stuff. It's going to happen sooner than, than one thinks. And yeah. uh, there, are, there are tools that are similar, but there are some things like teleportation dealing with Hamiltonians, um, you know, superposition, that are just new concepts that uh, you're going to want to explore. Not only from just a, a programming standpoint do you want to keep up to speed, but it's just fascinating. It's, uh, the whole quantum world is non-intuitive to our, our world that you and I you know, drink coffee in. It's, uh, it's a very different space, and it really does open your mind up. The, um, when, you, when you look at all of Azure today, like, I don't know what it is, 35, 39, something like data, data centers, so many, bringing all of that computational power in one place is still, it's just a drop in the bucket compared to what you'll be able to accomplish with a quantum machine. But it, do you think quantum computing is going to erase uh, classical computing? No. Uh, again, like you're... There are a lot of things where a, a classical computer does a, a, a great job, mm -hmm. like um, you know, again, like browsing the web or you know doing your email or checking up on your sports and stuff like that. But there are a certain class of things where you you you're dealing with these massive computational spaces. You know, like 230 qubits, like you can address almost 10 to the 80 computational spaces, which is more atoms than there are in the universe. And so some of these things where you're trying to explore um, a lot of different possibilities and you can develop your algorithms in the right way to take advantage of it, you're going to be able to solve problems. Again, again, quantum chemistry, material science, machine learning are all things that we know about. You're just going to be able to solve a set of problems that heretofore we're not, we were not able to solve. Yeah. And I mean the impact on machine learning and artificial intelligence, and I mean, I mean it's incredible. You, it'll be, you could almost just let your mind wander, and yeah. you're probably yeah. you're probably right, yeah. uh, probably what it could do. Uh, for for a long term perspective, for a software developer today, obviously mathematics is going to be an important thing to have under your belt, and uh, understanding these concepts is going to be important. Do you imagine? I don't know. Let's say 50 years from now, which is an 
astronomical time if you think about it in the world we live in today. I mean, five years from now when you turn the machine on, who knows what's going to happen. Then now we're guessing 50 years. Will people still be writing software? Uh, that's a tough question. You know, I, I believe that we will always be, well, in 50 years we'll be writing software. Yeah. I think that there's uh, enough new stuff coming up with quantum uh, and other techniques that we're, we're building on what we've done in the past and we're, we're continuing to innovate and we're continuing to look at new ways to do computation that uh, we'll still be writing software and being creative and using our creativity in, in ways that you know, other things can't think about. Now, one, one, one really neat thing I know about um, developing on the quantum side, if I, were to, if I were to write classical, it's funny to even talk about things to classical, we'll be dreaming up new languages and new algorithms and everything else in classical for years, right? And all, it still will be classical. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, that if I took a routine that I wrote uh, in classical C-sharp, <laughs> that's so weird to say. I the love C, to hear you say that, yeah. The C in C-sharp stands for classic. <laughs> uh, I like that. Um, then the, uh, and I were to translate that then over into Q-sharp, and I was going to make it so that it could run on a quantum system, one of the things I have to do is make the whole, al the whole process reversible. Is that right? Well, yes and no. Like, a quantum computer is a reversible computer mm. because physics is reversible, and so anything made out of physics. You know, in a classic computer, a classical computer, it doesn't have to be reversible, and it's not. But you will find just inherently that when you write a quantum algorithm, it is a reversible algorithm. Now, if a developer is interested, you know, they're watching the show and they're like, oh, right. yeah, I've got to find out about this. Um, they're going to pull up a lot of information on liquid, which they might look at it and not know that it's pronounced liquid because it's got some funny characters in it. Yes. But that liquid is an early language that came out of your team right. that was intended to simulate quantum operations, but, but Q-sharp is is superseding that. Is yes, that right? absolutely. Yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. Uh, Liquid did a great job, and uh, we love it, and, uh, but it's going away. Q-sharp is coming, and Q-sharp will be, uh, again, a programming language that is uh, built into Visual Studio, and it has a simulator that's much more powerful than the Liquid simulator. Mm -hmm. And in the future, we'll continue to build that out. At some point, you know, you're going to find you're going to find our simulator in Azure because the simulators take so much memory. Like to do 30 qubits is 16 gigabytes of memory. 40 qubits is uh, 16 terabytes of memory. And <laughs> 50 qubits is 16 petabytes of memory. So <laughs> you run out of memory in the world at some point. But, and that's the reason why you need to do it um, with to topological qubits to to do interesting things, but... Uh, and even those simulators, even though they're doing it, yeah. it just, just as a reminder, it's not a quantum machine. That, it's not executing at the speed of a quantum machine. It's just simulating the operation. It's just simulating it, and uh, like every time you add another qubit, you have to double your memory, and so you just, you eventually, at some point, you just can't. You have to stop, and you have to go at the, at the quantum level to really make things happen. Although I could see asking my manager about a small upgrade, that wouldn't be bad, just so I could have, you know, 40 qubits. They should, someday they'll start measuring RAM in qubits. <laughs> well, yeah, qubits is not a memory, but, you know, the, you could measure it in the amount of memory you would take to simulate a qubit. Right, like this, yeah, it'd be yeah. like the, the QS standard, you know, Q yes. simulator or quantum something. simulation <laughs> RAM memory. Um, so if... If a developer is listening, though, and let's say they found Liquid, they know that's not the thing they should be reading up about. Instead, I think we could point them to the, the Quantum Developers Kit, the one that we released back on right. December 11th. Yep. Yeah, just go to Microsoft Quantum, and you'll find it there. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to uh, see the QDK and Q Sharp, and you'll be able to download it and Mm -hmm. Visual Studio will pop right in, and you'll be able to start playing away, playing away and making qubits work. And it's not just for enterprise developers. Any developer that has Visual Studio can start dabbling in this and start kind of raising their acumen around it. So yeah. They have yeah, this. yeah. Again, it's free for everybody. It's uh, you know, based for the whole community that's out there. And 
I would, you can do it for a number of reasons. You know, I, at some point, these are going to be uh, very powerful. And, you know, I, you know, I can imagine, like I said, five, ten years, no later than that, you know, everybody, not everybody, a lot of people are going to be programming in quantum. Yeah. yeah. But again, I, I also found, you know, I, I, I jumped into this without being a, a quantum physicist. And I took, like I said, I took one quantum class in 1984, and I ended up reading 15 or so books on quantum. But it really causes you to expand your mind and think about things differently. And it's really a good exercise in, in being more creative and, and thinking about things in different perspectives. And I, I don't mind saying that you're pretty inspirational around this idea because not having a quantum physics, physics background and coming in and being able to you know, wrap your head around it, sure, a lot of your tutors are Nobel Prize winners, but at the same time, it's pretty amazing to think, I could do it too. You know, I, I mean, like, it's, not, it's not too late for me to get into quantum because this is the beginning of the beginning, and, um, and anybody could do it if they're, if they're motivated correctly. I, I totally agree, and, uh, and it's our job, and, and we're doing that, to make it so that it, developers can take what they already know you know these uh, these other languages like C sharp and F sharp and and uh, build on Visual Studios and then we're going to add new things and, and take them through that but uh, in, in a way that that they should understand and in a way that w will allow them to build their skill set. Um, talk to me about impact on some practical things. Uh, uh, an, an enterprise out there is considering, um, you know, how can we leverage quantum to make a difference in our company, what, what, what are some of the things you see impacting just a regular business, you know, not, not necessarily somebody splitting the atom, but just my company, and I, you know, we're a pretty big company, not gigantic, we're big in Colorado, what sort of thing might I be able to look forward to in the quant when the quantum world arrives? Yeah, the, the first thing that comes to mind is all the AI machine learning stuff, that when, with quantum training and quantum models, we think that we can develop models faster and we think that we can develop better models. And so, it, you know, the whole ML AI world is happening and it will continue to happen and quantum will, will make that uh, uh, better place. You know, any types of optimizations that you're doing, if you're trying to optimize a problem, mm -hmm. a quantum, quantum world is a better world for optimization. When you think about quantum, right, the, the beauty of an electron is that it can be any, everywhere. Yeah. And in, when you're optimizing something, you are trying to find a, a global minimum. And what you can do with an electron, it can actually tunnel through a mountain. So you're stuck in a local minimum. You can actually uh, tunnel through more easily than with a classical optimization mm. function and find the uh, global minima. And that, that, although there are tons of problems out there, a lot of them are related to ML, but everybody's trying to find the, the best portfolio to use, the, mm -hmm. quickest, the quickest traffic route to take, um, to try and find you know, how I should do my fantasy football team, what's the yeah. optimal program. <laughs> And, <laughs> Let's spend a couple billion yeah, dollars. Yeah. So we can win. I'm trying, I'm trying to make it real for all of us. <laughs> That's right. That's what yeah. I want. But you're going to uh, use the same algorithm as the first. Yeah, one. but and we're in to drive that point home. We're actually um, every time we learn a, a quantum algorithm, we have an opportunity to make our classical algorithms better. Ah, and we, we're actually simulating some of these. Uh, classical optimization problems with quantum, like, like as, a, as an electron, for example. And we found in certain cases that on a classical computer with a quantum-inspired algorithm, you know, we can go 4,000 times faster than you could do with a classical algorithm on a classical computer. And that, these are things that are happening today yeah. that you can apply. And so there, there's an opportunity, you know, I don't necessarily have to wait to apply quantum. You can start applying it today. And it all goes back to just the ability of quantum particles to be everywhere. And you can find these global minimas in a, uh, in a much quicker, faster way. Mm. That's, a, um, 
this idea of quantum inspired algorithms that come back into classical programming is pretty yep. incredible actually and it may be one of the neatest byproducts in the next decade before quantum actually gets its feet it could just be that that sort of work where you've turned it, you've caused everybody to shift gears in their mind into a, a new world and yep. uh, it's caused them to think about classical computing in a totally different way and it makes it that much that much better by now. Yeah, time. I think there are going to be immediate benefits, and you're already starting to see that uh, with these quantum-inspired algorithms. So uh, that's going to happen now in the next couple of years, and then you're going to see you know prototype computers get uh, better and smarter, and people are going to be trying it then on, on real quantum computers. You're going to start seeing uh, Q sharp in job descriptions soon. <laughs> it's just going to yeah. be one of those sort of crazy things where. I mean, it runs in a runtime, and it feel it has an IL. It feels like yeah. a real language that we know. And I guess it's worth pointing out that we're we're the same company that built C sharp and all these other languages, and all, all of those language architects are part of the team right. that's standardizing right. on on Q sharp. This will be the language that will live for a long, long time, and yeah. uh, be able to be able to scale out. If if we were talking about impact for developers. Um, what, what, what do you see as kind of the immediate or what's happening to the developer community in your mind? What's the dream that you would see happening? Is it partly the quantum-inspired work back towards classical? Yeah, you know, I, um, I did the Connect work, like I said, in uh, mm -hmm. 2000, started that in 2008. And, uh, you know, I'm a double E, but I became really passionate about machine learning because I, I saw the power of machine learning at that yeah. point. You know, you can tag all of these skeletons and uh, when you tag all of these skeletons, you can actually like put real people in front of Connect and uh, be able to track those skeletons. And sure. I, I got, so my kids were in high school at the time. I got them both to uh, get AI degrees and from, from college. And so I, I, I really tried to, to push them towards that. But now, you know, if I had known better, I would have had them do quantum computing because I think it's going to be that much more impactful. And uh, the stuff, you know, by you know, five years from now, again, I, I think you're going to be seeing people actually really program these things. And within the next, uh, starting now, you're going to start people using quantum-inspired algorithms to do your optimization. And mm -hmm. it's just going to allow us to do things in a more efficient and effective way and open up the, the space of uh, solving uh, different types of problems. Yeah, and y you know, it, it's funny, we, it, so much of our society is rooted in the idea that computers are, have a, a finite speed. Like if you look at like crypto uh, currency and things like that, they're really based on, well, it's gonna take a long time, this encryption would take a billion years to break, but once we have com uh, quantum computing, talk about a shift in gears. Uh, I don't. How are we possibly going to replace something that seems already so sophisticated? I, I guess people are working on a brand new problem already before the urgency is, is has arrived. Yeah, the the security one is a real issue, and uh, fortunately, there are a number of people that are already working on the the post quantum security problem. Microsoft is and. Uh, they have a bunch of proposals, and, and people are, are being thoughtful because it does take a long time to transition through a, a new security protocol, and yeah. there are a lot of people that are working and making sure that all of our transactions are safe. So probably for a little while, I'll just keep some gold bullion under my mattress. That, that way, everything stays gold bullion. <laughs> Who You'll knows? You'll be okay. You'll be okay. I'll be all right with You'll this gold. Right. I'll be going up try to trade gold bullion yeah. or something. Now, the reality is that the hope around quantum computing is we are going to solve some massive problems. I mean, once we get away from this idea of crypto, this and that, we, real, we will be able to give it some questions that it will be able to give us answers to, things like, and I, I guess, climate and, and disease and things like right. that. I, there's this long backlog that somebody's got, you know, let's just say, let's just pretend, and we're going to ask it this question, then this question, then this question, but Todd, if you were in charge, uh, what's your backlog look like? What's at the top of the list of questions you hope we answer quickly? Yeah, I, I think the, the top of my list is to, to go off and solve some of the, the big health issues that are out there. I, I think that there's a, that, um, 
there's a well, there's just a lot of suffering going on out there. There's uh, a lot of it's very difficult to diagnose these problems. It's very difficult to, to solve those. And, and I think there is an opportunity with a, a quantum computer uh, to get in there and help with optimization all the way to making the right drugs to looking at um, your ML algorithms that are trying to find a diagnosis and, and being able to, to make those ML algorithms better. So I think that, that for me, I, I did run the Microsoft Health Group for a year or so before doing this, and you just see how technology can go in there and help that space. And uh, I think quantum is a, is a, has, a, has, has a perfect opportunity to go in there and solve some of its tougher problems. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a brave new age we're entering into. And it's crazy because a lot of these questions were, seem insolvable today, but one of the yeah. reasons they seem so insolvable is because what we mean is they're just too big. They're just, too, you know, it would take too long. There's too much effort. And, but what, what would happen if we could just introduce a machine where the effort really isn't there and we could just do, we could just do it? It's, yeah, no, the, the, um, the one analogy I like to use is, these are not always perfect, but you know, in today's world, you you have a, a maze and you're trying to solve for the to solve the maze, and you go down one path and you hit a dead end, and so you have to go back and you go down another one, and and finally you solve it. But in the quantum world, you can go down all the paths at the same time, to get to your answer much more quickly mm. than you can in the classical world, and so. We start to think about a lot of these problems where you, know, you have a whole bunch of different options. It just takes you a long, it takes you a billion years to run through all the different options. Uh, in those, in that case, with a quantum computer, uh, there will often be ways to do all of those options at the same time, which is a powerful, powerful. Yeah, program. and mind-boggling. Yeah, it's mind-boggling. Well, I love the fact that we can say things like teleportation. Yes. Quantum entanglement, yes. <laughs> superposition, and it's yes. all real. I mean, honestly, this is so amazing. Now, uh, Todd, b b before I let you go here, um, what what's the one takeaway in your mind that you really hope that our Microsoft community, especially, uh, hears right here about Microsoft Quantum? Yeah, I, I think the the thing to know is that we're passionate about the space. Uh, we are we are. Uh, approaching it in a way that we're looking at an end-to-end -end solution. We, mm -hmm. We're engaging with developers now. This is a new way to think about programming and developing, and so it's a great way for us to solve and tackle a set of problems that uh, we couldn't solve in the past. And uh, we are your partner in this uh, journey, <laughs> and we believe that we have the tool set that will allow you to be successful. And with these tools, you know, we have an opportunity to, to make a profound impact uh, in the world mm. and uh, a very exciting opportunity as well. That's cool. And, and an opportunity for developers and everybody participating with us to be able to feed back in. I mean, quantum right. certainly isn't mature. We have plenty of time to uh, be able to make an impact on something that will probably change humanity when we look back on it. It probably it will change, yeah. definitely will change. And we are, like you say, we are in the early stages of it, and we're always looking for feedback. Uh, we do have a growth mindset, and it's always good to, to get input <laughs> on what we're doing. Yeah, great point. Yeah. All right, if you're a developer, and this is inspiring to you as it is to me, why don't you check out the new Quantum Developer Kit preview that we released on December 11th. Just go to your favorite search engine, and you'll find it easily at the Microsoft site. Todd, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you, Jerry. It's been great. Uh, really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. We'll talk to you again. Thanks.